Tuesday, September 3rd, this is Senate Government Operations. And um, <clears throat> we have with us today, David Hurley and Lauren Hibbert. And um, what we've been doing committee is um, looking at the, a bill that we could hopefully pass now that would put in place um, provisions that we might need to have in place should we be hit with this kind of a, an emergency or another kind of an emergency that really stymies us and, and have them in place so we don't have to do the same kind of scrambling that we did in um, March and April. So what we've done so far is we've looked at um, the, the municipal things we passed and some of the, the elections issues and we're gonna take more testimony on those. Um, <clears throat> and we thought that there, I, uh, Betsy Ann was kind enough to remind us that there were some things in the medical, uh, both in OPR and in the medical board that um, gave some, in, in certain circumstances gave some, um, I'm not gonna go into it, I'll let Betsy do it, but, but gave some, did some deadline changing and also gave some authority to the directors to make some decisions if they couldn't um, be made the way they normally are. And so this isn't changing anything permanently. It's only putting into the statutes in case there's another similar type emergency. Does that make sense to you? We just don't wanna come back and, well, we don't wanna be hit in the fall in late November with something that we're totally unprepared to deal with because the deadlines have passed and there's no more declared emergency. And now it's a new declared emergency or in January or March. So that's what we're trying to do here. And um, so Betsy, Ann and Tucker have been working on this bill with us. And I'm just going to, unless anybody has any questions or other comments or anything on this, I'm just going to turn it over to um, them to do this. And I will say committee that um, I'd sent a note out about the VSEA language that we needed to talk about that um, to, so we could contact the appropriations committee. But I had a, a call this morning and so it's less urgent than I thought. And we can talk about that later. But while we have Lauren and David with us, let's, let's jump there if that's okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Betsy Ann and Tucker to go through the, um, they've gone through the bill that they originally did, and then they might have changes, and then we want your input, and okay. I, I, no. I think we have the new draft on the website <laughs> under, today, under today's date. Okay, great. Thank you. If it's okay, since we have uh, the directors here with us, um, if that's okay, we can turn to their parts first. Sure, um, yes. So I sent committee members and Director Hibbert and Executive Director Hurley he, this draft language. And what I've just done so far is just copied and pasted in regard to their provisions, that language that was in Act 91. Um, just so you can see what wasn't enacted. And I was envisioning that perhaps the committee can discuss with the directors um, whether they would like to see these temporary provisions codified in their statutes regulating their professions. So oh, and I have, let, I'm just gonna interrupt one second here. And I have contacted um, Ginny Lyons and Beth Fastigia and a bunch of people to ask if they also have things that came out of their committee that might not be in our, and um, so we want Betsy Ann to contact Jen Carby and see if there are things in there that they might need to put in here also. Okay. So we're, we're looking at Betsy Ann's draft, not yes. the Tucker Muni one, it's the other draft. There are two things up there. This is pages 13, 13 pages. Yeah, Tucker and I ended up splitting just because we were running on different schedules today. So thank you, Tucker. Um, so I just have a separate document now. We can put it back into one doc, but it was just easier for Tucker and I to um, address our issue, our separate areas in two pieces of 
or two documents for now, but we can always combine them back into two. Um, so just a refresher, Act 91 was the first COVID Act that the General Assembly enacted. And in starting in Section 14, there were provisions in regard to the regulation of professions. And in Section 14, there was an actual statutory amendment to OPR's uh, board authority to issue temporary licenses during a declared state of emergency. They already had the authority to issue temporary licenses during a declared state of emergency. And for OPR, there was just language added um, that a person um, to also add the authority for a person who is a graduate of an approved education program during a period when licensing exams are not reasonably available could be issued a temporary license and those could be reissued. And then similarly in section 15, there was language added to the Board of Medical Practices statutes about being able to issue temporary licenses during a st uh, state of declared state of emergency. And it looks similar to what OPR's um, language was um, that they had. Um, but then it went on to provide, starting in section 17, um, some temporary session law provisions that uh, were directed at the circumstances during COVID. And that's what appears here, uh, starting on page five. If you wanna go there, um, what's listed now is section 17 on line nine in that doc, which is just a copy and paste of Act 91 to get the discussion going. To from the directors if they would like to have um, this or similar provisions put into codified statutory law tailored to any or some certain types of states of emergency. So I think section 17, and we can have the directors weigh in further with more details, um, provided that during the COVID state of emergency, a healthcare professional, including a mental health professional, who holds a license in any other US jurisdiction is deemed to be uh, licensed to provide healthcare services, which includes mental health services to a patient located in Vermont using telehealth or as part of the staff of a licensed facility if certain criteria are met at the top of page six they're licensed in that other US jurisdiction. They're not subject to any professional disciplinary proceedings in that other US jurisdiction. And they're not barred from practice here in Vermont for reasons of fraud or abuse, patient care, public safety. Um, if they're going to, if that healthcare professional is going to plan to provide healthcare services here in Vermont, um, they'd have to provide contact information to either the board or OPR as applicable. And then it went on to provide that that healthcare professional would be subject to the imputed jurisdiction of the Board of Medical Practice or OPR as applicable. So if um, <clears throat> what, what we did, just for your information on the other provisions that we talked about, the municipal and open meeting and that kind of thing is, we just removed the, um, as a result of COVID-19 or the declared emergency under COVID-19. And um, Betsy, Ann and Tucker, we're gonna make some, do some language about it being a, a public health emergency where, because that, that would be what you couldn't, some things would be public health emergencies. There might be other things that are just any kind of an emergency, but, but in these cases, it's probably a public health emergency. Uh, Madam Chair, yes. I think that actually, I mean, I can foresee an emergency that would not be a public health emergency that would require this kind of extension of public health help. You know, it, let's say we had, I mean, I don't know, something that just were a, a, a physical thing that happened that required extra hands on deck yep. from the medical profession that, you know, that. So a, a physical disaster that would require more medical attention and more medical help that where this would be quite useful, actually. Yep, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's say all the water was poisoned somehow, you know, that you know, the, 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 the groundwater had some huge 
challenge and, and everyone had it, it, major intestinal problems and we needed more doctors, nurses, and PAs. How great to be able to take advantage of this in, in that kind of a declared emergency. Yep. Yeah, I, I think some, when I said that some things we talked about requiring some kind of a public health emergency. Right, like they the did. Yeah. Meeting laws and stuff. You, you might, you might want to limit them, but something like you just pointed out could certainly happen and, and we would, it would be good if we could have something like this in place so that we didn't have to scramble around, but. Yeah. So Betsy Ann Tucker. David or Lauren, do you have any questions up to this point about kind of where we're going and what we're trying to do? Um, no, do you, do you want us to, to uh, give any comments at this point or? Sure. I just, I, I think that it's a, a good idea. I think, um, you know, there, there would need to be, because there's so many different kinds of emergencies um, and this is really um, authorizing this, you know, deemed status is really not with, without some dangers for, for Vermont too. Um, the, I think that we need to figure out a way to, to limit it, you know, so, so that there's a, a rational system for identifying when it's, when it's time to, to do this and maybe allow, you know, bring in somebody like the, the um, if authorized by the commissioner of health or if authorized by the secretary of human services that this can happen so that you know we don't need for, for you all to be in session to, to get this power, but that it's um, you know limited in some other way um, so, so that so that it's only used when when appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. And it might be different for different different um, agencies and different boards and um, yeah. You're right here. So Lauren, did you have any comments up to this point? Sure, yeah. I mean, these provisions at OPR we've used um, quite a bit. I was just um, asking staff, we've had um, 401 uh, emergency licenses for students who need to take exams, for instance. That's a permanent fix to statute, not something that needs to be added to this bill, but just so you know, that has meant that those folks can take their exams and start getting into their career and COVID hasn't stopped them. So I think that's fairly remarkable. Um, and um, on our list of people who registered with OPR who are licensed in another state, um, I was just looking that up and we had, um, we are at um, 1,210 people who are working in Vermont um, with a different license from another state. So not wow. a single thing, a relatively do you, large. Do you have a sense, Lauren, of how long they worked? I mean, of those 1,210 licenses you extend that they were, who were able to work here, do you have a notion of how long they worked in Vermont before they went back to their jurisdiction or or didn't? I don't. That wasn't um, part of our form and we haven't followed back up with them. Um, our plan, we have contact information with them and when the authority to work ends, we're planning to contact them all that their deemed authority has ended. Um, I do think there's possible um, confusion. There may be some folks who are doing telehealth who never had to register with our office who might have registered on that form. Um, right. But I do know that we are answering probably, it's calmed down some since um, early summer, but we're answering upwards of, you know, six or seven emails a day about telehealth and whether you can do that if you're licensed in another state to a patient here. So that has been very heavily utilized um, for patients and providers, um, both in Vermont and outside of Vermont. And did you say that those changes were permanent? No. So they, okay. 
The only change that I've talked about that's permanent is the ability for us to issue temporary licenses to people who can take exams because of an emergency. Okay. The telehealth provisions and the deemed authority to practice in the state of Vermont, if you're licensed in another state, are not permanent. They're not ongoing outside of Act 91 um, and the extension within Act 91 to um, March 31st, third, uh, 2021. Um, which was a prudent choice of date, I think, when we were, um, you know, in June. Um, but I do think that those provisions will need to be extended um, into the summer. Um, and we kept, we had discussed both in this committee and in Senate Health and Welfare that date um, of um, 31 <laughs> because we anticipated that we would be back in a legislative session in January of 2021 and we'd be able to push that date out again. Um, I see this bill as a sort of more of a long-term solution to some of those issues as, as opposed to just continually pushing the date out till the next legislative session and then pushing the date out until the next legislative session. So I think it's, it's proactive and prudent. Um, and I do like the idea that David has about having some, um, express authority. I think um, the declaring of an emergency, I'm not an expert, but I think the declaring of the emergency, um, my understanding is it must be done by the governor. Uh, the governor has to make that declaration um, and a piece of the declaration could include these provisions um, that this declaration might trigger these provisions of the law. Um, it could be the commissioner of health, OPR wouldn't object if that were true um, for the OPR professions as well, that would be okay. Um, or it could be the Secretary of Human Services, uh, but I, I see it as very closely tied to that declaration of emergency, which is um, the, the triggering, I see this bill as creating springing conditions to a triggering event and the triggering event is that declaration of emergency. So I think the governor could trigger them, um, but it does make sense the deemed authority um, to practice in the state without passing through a regulatory body does make those of us who are regulators nervous. Um, it has worked out fine. We haven't had any instances of misconduct that I'm aware of by someone who's working here um, in the state without a Vermont license, but it could happen. Um, and does, you know, I think there should be some scrutiny, scrutiny into whether or not that should be allowed um, from a higher level than us assuming that we can just start doing it. Mm -hmm. So Allison. Lauren, I'm just curious why it isn't, and David too, why it isn't enough to have their boss. I mean, the governor is the boss of the, the commissioner of health and the secretary of the agency of human services. Why isn't it enough to have a gubernatorial declaration of emergency? Well, I. I was just trying to make the point that it's not just any emergency, so it's it it needs to be a separate determination, and you know whether that's going to be specifically the governor, who if there is another broad-based emergency, um, you know may be focused on a lot of different things, and and I just thought of the health commissioner or, or secretary of human services to make that separate decision. I mean, obviously, you know, an emergency is it has to be declared by by the governor. There's no other official with that authority. But then there's, you know, a second decision of, is it an emergency of the, that's of a nature that requires. Right. Uh, yeah. What type of an emergency it is. Right. I mean, you know, if there was an ice storm is, is you know, or, or um, you know, a big tropical storm often triggers declaration of an emergency, but, um, you know, would it, would it be reason to uh, implement these provisions? I think that's a, <clears throat> could you, um, if we put this, these in this bill, work with Betsy to get some language so that around the health issues, and I, I, I would say it probably should be the, the commissioner of the Department of Health, or if you're talking about health related um, provisions. Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank David for, and Lauren too, for kind of putting the spotlight on this because I think it is very important 
Um, and I'll just use the phrase checks and balances. It's not really that exactly, but it is a situation where, and I think David put it well, the governor, he or she at that moment would be facing a whole bunch of decisions that needed to be made. And so I would look to uh, someone else and maybe that person would automatically um, seek counsel from you know, other agency heads. But I think it doesn't hurt to put it in statute and make sure that, that there is some sort of communication going back and forth uh, and the health commission is fine with me. Um, so I'll, thank you both. Anthony. Oh, I agree with that. Also, this might be already understood, but when, when David mentions like the ice yeah. storm or something like that, it makes you think about whether the emergency yeah. has to be of, a, of an extended time frame. In other words, an ice storm might create an emergency, which might be gone two days later because things warm up and melt away, as opposed to something like COVID-19, which is going to stick around for a long time. So I wonder whether there's in terms of defining an emergency, whether it has to be an emergency of some kind of magnitude or some kind of time frame that would require these things to kick in. Just a thought, I'm, I have no idea really. Lauren? I just wanted to say that I really support that statement, Senator Polina, because as a regulatory entity, it actually takes quite a bit of work to stand up these programs to get the form, you know, it's not um, always there, so if it's, if it's an ice storm and it's two days, um, then the standard temporary licenses that we can use under our emergency professions provisions would be work well because they're always there. But these extra um, sort of scaffolding and support we really built in um, March and it did take some time, um, not a huge amount of time, but it took some time. And then once this, um, this scenario is gone, we'll remove it. Um, I suppose we'll have to con consider, do we always want it to be back in the background? But um, I, if it's for a, a longer period of time, it makes more sense to have the deemed authority to work here and the authority to do telehealth. If it's for a couple of days, that doesn't make as much sense. So maybe that's where the um, working with the commissioner of health comes in, they can determine that it's going to be everybody in Vermont has stomach flu and we need more doctors here. And the stomach flu is gonna last for two and a half weeks. Maybe we need some more or maybe we don't. If it's gonna last for a day, maybe we don't need to do this at all. So I would think that maybe in consultation with the commissioner of health, if that's who is the decision is, if that's who it is, that that would be worked out. I I'm see sorry. Isabel has joined us. Mm -hmm. Can't stop smiling. Look, you're muted, Allison. I'm trying to please Brian. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, what Lauren just said is, I think, precisely why we're doing this bill. Lauren uh, and I assume David did too. Uh, put in a lot of work standing up something that uh, was a that was a response to an emergency. That investment of your time, it, it's a good thing to embed that as an opportunity for a future emergency. Well, you know, that was a lot of, that was, that was great work, but we need to be able to use that work in the future. So I think that's part of why we're doing this is you all invested time responding, enabling things for an emergency. And let's take the best of that and make that possible for the future without as much work. Okay, do we want to move on with other issues in this? Thank you. All right, so the next uh, provision regarding OPR and Board of Medical Practice is on page seven in the section 18. This is about retirees being able to come back and practice. And the language from Act 91 was that during the COVID state of emergency, a former healthcare professional who retired not more than three years earlier with the individual's Vermont license in good standing can provide healthcare services to a patient located in Vermont using telehealth or as part of staff of a licensed facility after submitting um, or having submitted on their behalf to either the board or OPR as applicable, their name and contact inf information and where they be practicing. 
and um, a retiree who does so um, would be subject to the regulatory jurisdiction of the board or OPR as applicable. At the top of page eight, the other provision regarding retirees is during the COVID emergency, um, the board and OPR could permit um, former healthcare professionals who retired um, between three and 10 years ago with their Vermont license in good standing to return to the healthcare workforce on a temporary basis to provide healthcare services to patients in Vermont. And they could issue, those two regulatory entities could issue temporary licenses to those individuals at no charge and impose limits on their scope of practice of returning to work as the board or OPR deemed appropriate. May, may I just ask David and Lauren, how many retired uh, doctors or professionals returned? How, uh, do you have, uh, have numbers on how many uh, came out of retirement to help us? Um, I, for us, not, not a lot. I think, um, you know, overall with, I, I have a spreadsheet with emergency licenses and overall we, we were under 25 total. Um, and, uh, but that's, that's both, um, you know, other emergency licenses and retiree. I would say that probably there were, um, somewhere around 10 retirees who, who took advantage of this. Um, and just, one one thing I want to make sure to, to comment on is I think um, we we need to find some some different wording from retiree because mm -hmm. really in professional licensing retirement isn't um, you know isn't something that that's like um, I don't formally traceable or you know it's um, it, it's really if they've any for anybody who held the license. Um, but also I, th I think was in active practice within maybe the last three years or something like that. We, we just, we had one case with somebody who had um, left active practice a long time ago after some, some um, disciplinary problems in New York and bought a house in Vermont and moved to Vermont. And um, he, he was able to get a Vermont license, um, and then he had he had not actively practiced for I think about more than ten years, uh, but continued to renew his license and was was able to to keep his license, and then only recently had let his license lapse, and tried to come back, and you know it just it it um that that case just came to mind in in this discussion of um. It, it might be more important to, to mention, um, you know, someone whose who's Vermont license has uh, lapsed within three years of them leaving active practice, or, or even if they actively practice in another jurisdiction, it would be okay. We, we need to figure out some way of capturing the, the concept of, of not, not too far out of, uh, uh, you know, because, um, you know, skills, go pretty quickly. And even though in an emergency, we, we want the help, um, it, you know, you, you want them to be ready to assist. So we've only had two retiree licenses um, during COVID um, on an emergency basis. Uh, I would posit that that's probably because of the state of this emergency and the risk um, to people who are older. Um, with this particular pandemic, um, I think the majority of quote unquote retirees um, is probably being far more cautious than some of the younger folks. Um, but I agree with David on both um, moving away from the word retiree, um, from my perspective, um, inactive licensee or lapsed license licensee would be um, preferable. I, I prefer inactive, but we you know, that, that would be okay. Either one would work. Um, and I also um, would like a nexus to practice, um, you know, three within the last inactive license um, with active practice within the last three years in Vermont or another jurisdiction um, makes sense to me. Okay. 
And how about the uh, the disciplinary issue? Um, if so, but but if they were active practice and good standing within the last three years, um, is it still okay if they had you know some sort of condition on their license before then? Or no, I would prefer if they were in good standing. Okay. Just good standing, but when they they were no longer practicing, they were in good standing. For example, if they completed their conditions, would that count as good standing? If they had to yeah. complete any conditions for under their license? It, it would. I, I, agree. I, I think it would be okay. And, you know, we always have, um, there's the provision that allows us to include limitations. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, is the, the language that we had was, was, um, fairly discretionary, but we avoided an argument with, with the individual by, you know, the board asked for conditions that um, were found unacceptable to the, to the applicant. And um, so the, the issue went away, but so that's always there too. Committee, is this something that you want to pursue? Oh, yeah, if, if it would be helpful. I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The next one is section 19. Um, this is on page eight. This is in regard to people practicing here in Vermont without holding a Vermont license as authorized during the declared state of emergency is deemed to be and consenting to the authority of the regulatory entities, either OPR, Board of Medical Practice. So this seems to be catch-all language. I'm not as familiar with it, but is it, it says as may be authorized during a declared state of emergency for their, them to practice. Is that just in this bill or perhaps also by governor executive order or how expansive was this authority to practice without a license? Um, I think it was in the, it was in the deemed section. Okay, um, it was going back to that previous section. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I, I don't think like, you know, this didn't come up and we, we didn't end up having anybody um, come on, under, under a, um, you know, an exchange with, with another state, but I think we would not want to have it um, apply to that, you know, uh, uh, an EMAC situation. Um, but um I think we, Betsy, we just, we need to look at that and make, make, um, make sure that there's not an unintended interaction with, with like an EMAC situation under Title 20. Okay. And that, that's, can you remind us the, what the EMAC is about? The EMAC is the Emergency Assistance uh, Compact. Okay. Which has provisions regarding liability okay. of individuals already and I, we, we can't mess with that because it's a compact. Yeah. So we would have to make sure we excluded anybody who was under an EMAC. Okay. But if you're there, if the person's um, working under at least a temporary license, under some temporary license authority, then would it be safe to say that then, then they are subject to OPR or the board's um, jurisdiction, if it's actual temporary license issued by yes, OPR. they they would they would. I I think whether it's a temporary whatever kind, they would be subject to jurisdiction. Yeah, okay. this was a concern with the with the deemed. Okay. Of people. Okay. Okay, so next one is on page nine regarding section twenty. This was. Um, the ability of the director of OPR and the executive director of the Board of Medical Practice to um, authorize acts on behalf of the boards, as I understand it, underneath OPR or Board of Medical Practice. Have I essentially, is, is that a summary of like, you're able to work or act on behalf of the boards if the board, if it's not safe for the boards to meet? Dan, if I could just go back to the imputed jurisdiction. Um, 
I really need to retain, I think we landed there, but I, I'm sorry, I was a bit distracted. Um, the imputed jurisdiction will remain for folks who do not hold a license in the state of Vermont, temporary or permanent, correct? Yes. Okay. But I think it would need, what I had said to Betsy was, I think that we need to make sure um, that we're, we're okay with, um, that there's no unintended interaction of affecting EMAC and EMAC okay. situation. Okay. Just if folks are doing telehealth for Vermonters, I want to have jurisdiction over them. And I know David would too, so. Okay. Betsy, you're muted. I apologize for taking it. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'll just follow up with the two of you and putting further language together. Um, but back to that section 20 language, um, this is language providing that if the director of OPR finds that a regulatory body attached to OPR can't reasonably, safely, and expeditiously convene a quorum to transact business, um, the director can act exercise the full powers and authorities of that regulatory body, including disciplinary authority. And it looks like it's similar, uh, similar language for the executive director of the board of medical practice. And um, so um, I will say for OPR, we did use this authority on multiple occasions. I do think this had a lot of utility particularly in the beginning of our time in COVID. Um, we had a lot of work to do, um, including we adopted emergency rules for remote hearings, disciplinary hearings. That took some time. Um, we wanted to engage with stakeholders. We are doing emergency, um, we're conducting disciplinary hearings um, under those emergency rules. Now, I fully anticipate that in the future we will build our administrative rules so they have um, sort of the springing condition of the ability to do remote disciplinary hearings um, if there's a state of emergency. Um, but I think that authority has been very helpful and I can imagine circumstances um, where we will not be able to convene a board, but we need to act quickly. David, have you used it? Um, just one time in a very limited way, and that was just to, to sign an order that I had talked about with my uh, board members about, and, and that was just about a uh, fairly uh, um, limited issue with regard to uh, PA documentation. We, we were able, we, we pretty quickly got together the ability to, to meet remotely, and so I didn't have to act without the, the board. Um, and I think um, I would, you know, it's, it's the way it's written and was written in Act 91 said, if I myself found that the board cannot reasonably safely and expeditiously convene a quorum. And I think, um, I think it would be good to, you know, limit that to when authorized by some other official again, you know, whether it's the, um, um, the Commissioner of Health or the Secretary of Human Services, there should be somebody else making that call. So I'm thinking that <clears throat> um, it, in this case, it may not be um, a health, a public health emergency that um, limits your ability to meet, but if, if there's a major power outage that where you can't connect remotely, um, I, I don't know. I can't. I don't know what that might be, but but there might be other reasons why um, it would limit your ability to meet. And um, so you would want to have Department of Health. And Lauren, do you feel the same way that you would want some other um, authority, or do you feel comfortable just doing it? I. I feel comfortable with the director doing it because I feel comfortable with the scenarios in which I did it, but I'm not sure that's the best metric. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, we used it for disciplinary hearings for all sorts of guidance um, because we had, you know, our 48 professions, we were helping 
uh, coordinate with ACCD on closing all those establishments and businesses and opening up all those establishments and businesses. And there was a period of time where we were moving very fast um, and as quickly as possible. And had we needed to convene a board for all of those um, discussions, even if it was a remote board, we would have struggled. Um, so um, I don't know whether it will be that same scenario again. Um, and I would agree that it could be a non health emergency where we would need that ability to act. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would want to be careful that it, if it, we did use the commissioner of health. Um, well, and, and I, I wasn't saying that commissioner health for necessarily for, for um, OPR. I mean, you might right. you know, use yeah. the secretary of state I, or. Perhaps the secretary of state would be appropriate there for the OPR ability, just so that. Um, yeah, the well, just, just to separate that decision. For yeah. the person who's going to be exercising the authority, I think that does make sense, David. I think, I think the Secretary of State and um, can authorize the director to do that. That makes yeah. sense. That relationship is and should always be a very close one, anyway. So, um, I think that would work well. Good. Don't give away too much, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, the last issue that I have here for the directors is on page 10, section 21. The last section um, that I uh, borrowed from Act 91 was allowing OPR and the Board of Medical Practice, um, the executive director, actually it was the director of OPR and commissioner of health to issue emergency regulatory orders. Um, in re if they find that a professional practice um, by a licensee is exploitive, deceptive, or detrimental to the public. Um, they can issue cease and desist orders. And then if the professional act continues, um, it could subject the person to professional discipline and could also result in uh, the penalties under 3 VSA 127, which are in regard to unauthorized practice. Comments? Yeah, I think that would be um, a good idea to have have in place again. You know, it's um, hard for us to imagine uh, a, an emergency of a breadth and duration that would call this, you know, make, make this um, necessary, but we can imagine it a lot better now than we could six months ago. So Exactly. Uh, there are more we getting more at what you anticipate. Unfortunately, yes, we can imagine a lot of things that we didn't imagine six yeah. months ago. Did so, you have to use this authority or what, what were you envisioning using it for and what was the purpose of this? So um, you're speaking about the authority in section 21, correct? Yes, OPR did use this authority. Um, we had, um, scenario where there was someone um, in Rutland County advertising MMA fighting, um, during, which is mixed martial arts um, during the time of COVID. So we wrote a letter um, with um, the attorney general's office um, asking them to stop. And we actually wrote a couple of letters for people who were not following um, ACCD guidance on appropriately closing or operating um, during this time. So it was helpful to us. That's great. I don't know the exact number. I, the MMA one is the one that um, jumps out at me the most, but um, I think I think we did um, maybe seven or eight of those letters with the AGO's office. Okay. So have we gone through all of the those provisions? Am I right about that? I just lost Betsy Ann. Where'd she go? There she is. Um, am I right that we've gone through all the provisions? 
here. Yeah. So what I would suggest is that we we are, as you know, in a bit of a time crunch here, mm -hmm. and we expect to be uh, gone, done on the twenty fifth. So that gives us three weeks, which means it, we have to do something. We have to get it to the Senate. We have to get it to the House. They have to do something. And I'm trying to work with Sarah Copeland Hansis about keeping in touch so that we know what the issues might be and <clears throat> can work them out. But if at all possible, I it would be great if we could have this on the floor by next Friday. Is I, I know that's really pushing it, but um, and I'm asking Betsy if that's even possible. And um, Tucker, I'll ask later on also if that's even possible, but as much as possible, if we can keep that in our heads as a, a goal and, and we won't get everything in this bill, that's clear. We're not gonna, but the more we can get in here around this, um, the, I think the better off we are, the less scrambling we'll have to do if it happens again, and it probably will. So does that, Betsy Ann, Tucker, David, Lauren, committee, does, is that, am I being totally unreasonable? No, I think that's the whole point of this. Less, I think it's great. And, and then the house can continue to work on it. And we, if we have other thoughts, we can feed them to Sarah. Yeah. It's not, I mean, I, I, I think it's a, work in progress until it isn't until it's done yeah so let's see uh, chris um just on timing i think the you know the way i heard what the pro tem said today on the floor was three weeks from today's the maximum mm -hmm. so it could be you know if the budget you know how it is if the budget gets settled doesn't yeah. it it's, we could be out of here i don't know three four five days be prior to that so I, I, I'm not seeing that given the work in in the committees that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting in this Senate economic development is we're going to be using right up to the max, given the governor has put most of his CRF money and uh, a lot of the budget stuff in economic development. I mean, I, I see us working right up to the last minute and probably on to Saturday. I mean, I, I'd be amazed. I'll, I'll be very impressed if we're actually able to finish Friday, the 25th. So Betsy and, Tucker, Betsy and Tucker haven't said anything, though. I know. Yeah. They're just, <laughs> just amused. Keep them on mute so they can't, they can't object. <laughs> They're amused by what we think we know. <laughs> right, time's up, Tucker and Betsy. You're done. We can't hear any more from you. <laughs> They're the ones that have to do the work. I know. Well, look so, what they did overnight. I mean, they're amazing. I know. But I don't know what how much else they are having to do right now. So weigh in and tell me if that is completely unreasonable. Please. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> that is not completely unreasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Not, not completely unreasonable. Yeah. <laughs> we can do it. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. It's just right. unreasonable, not completely unreasonable. <laughs> They're being too polite. All right. So we're going to aim for uh, getting it out of here on Thursday. And I'll be working with Tim and the, uh, I guess we're going to have to have permission from the um, rules committee to do it. So I have told him that we're doing this and I'll keep sending him drafts um, and sending um, Sarah Copeland Hans's drafts. Okay. All right, so that means that um, if we can have some resolution of these particular issues, David and Lauren is, and Betsy Ann, is it possible to have them by tomorrow or by Tuesday at the very latest? 
I could definitely do Tuesday. I don't know if tomorrow I will definitely be able to get it perfect. Okay. Um, I will start working on this language, put it into their statutory structures and send to the two directors um, to get their feedback and see if they would like any changes. So maybe we can say tentatively tomorrow, but Tuesday, Tuesday. might be more realistic. And I'll help however I can. Yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I'll get back to Betsy as quickly as possible. Thank you both. Thank you both. And thank you. This was very short notice, I know. And thank you very much. Yep. Thanks oh, for taking it up. Yeah, I think it's a really important issue and a good way to build for the future, which hopefully well, yeah. we don't even yeah. need it. We have well, uh, Senator Collimore loves to call it the shelf bill, but now it's become more than a shelf bill because it was going to be a bill that we could just pull off the shelf and institute, but now we're going to actually put it into the statute and we won't have to even pull it off the shelf. Right. And, and it makes something positive out of this incredible crisis, which is less, we've learned some good lessons that we are going to carry forward. Yep. And it's carry forward that isn't money. It's okay. So thank you very much, the two of you. Thank awesome. you. And thank I believe you. we'll be joined by the elections tomorrow. Awesome. They can do it today. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank for you your both. time and it's great to see you all. It's Thank great you. to see you. I'm missing our adventure out west about this time. <laughs> We're gonna get back to a normal time um, and I look forward to that. Yes, me too. All right, um, do we want to move to the, um, Betsy Ann, did you have more? Yeah. Madam Chair, can we just quickly review the rest of this and I can turn it over to Tucker. Okay. But if you just wanna keep going uh, on page 11, just a reminder, there was that uh, temporary language about electrician and plumber licenses. I yeah. didn't do anything with that because you listed it kind of as a to be determined yesterday. Oh yeah. And it seemed like a one-off, but I didn't know if there needed to be any further um, movement on this issue. Well, I haven't. Uh, yeah, Allison. I think that there's should be some provision um, for it, licenses which expire during an emergency. So once a declared emergency has been declared, it, it could last. It, it could last for uh, a couple weeks. It could last for a couple months. It could last for a year. Uh, it makes some sense. I mean, I was dealing today during our hour break between committee and the floor. I, I had to do something at the bank and they were talking about their license expiring. Licenses expire and we need to have ways to deal with them during the course of a, a declared emergency. So I think it makes some sense to have a sort of more general language about licenses that expire or, or anything that expires during the course of a, an emergency. Well, I think that um, we've dealt with two. We've dealt with um, licenses or permits that are issued by the state to municipalities. Right. And ones that are issued by municipalities to people. We haven't dealt with ones that are issued by the state to people. And I think that's that's what you're talking about here or, or to businesses, to, to not to municipalities, but to private um, and I don't know the best way of doing that. I was going to, um, I don't know if we have just a general thing someplace that says that the governor can, um, can uh, how did we uh, put it for um, ones that are issued to municipalities? It just says the governor can um, put a stop on, or can, I'm, this room has gotten very hot all of a sudden. Um, so we, I, I don't know if we can do the same kind of thing someplace is just say that the governor in a declared emergency, the governor has the ability to um, delay the licensing, license renewals for, um, and then they would probably have to be made, some of them may be, um, delayed and some of them they may say 
we're not going to delay them, but that the, the governor would have the ability to, to do that. And then we don't have to deal with um, DMV separately and um, fish and the um, fire and safety all separately. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, I could do something for all of the licenses issued under the office of governor and then separately it would seem to make sense to have a similar provision for the secretary of state yes. um, for the OPR licenses and I don't think there's any other of the statewide electeds that issue licenses. I don't think so. so they all would all be under the governor. Yeah other than OPR so. OPR. Okay. We we know it's an issue and it could be an issue even actually with a fairly short duration. You know, <laughs> if, anyway. Yeah, I'll come up with something for that. Okay. Oh, there's the director of OPR back again. Did you, were you able to hear that? A little bit. I was afraid I missed something <laughs> in coming off this, this Zoom and going into the live stream, but um, we would be supportive of something giving us the power to extend professional licenses. I, I wasn't sure if this was only for muni licenses or not, but professional licenses should be included as well. Yeah, oh good. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, awesome. We'll Thank do. you. <laughs> and then the last item in this draft is in regard to the emergency sheriff funding. Did you want to maintain some form of this in this bill? Oh, I don't know. I, I did. I did not. Um, I didn't contact them. Let me contact. Uh, Jack Anderson is the yes and and um, I'll do him and sheriff. Uh, uh, it'll have to be. It'll be Bill Boniak because Mark Anderson, I believe, is on act is on active duty right now. Oh, um, or he's someplace doing. Is he a National Guards person? Yeah. Oh. And he is someplace, I don't know if it's training or whatever, but he isn't around. Hmm. Um, and will be until October. So it'll be, it'll be Bill Boniak. Okay. I'll, co I'll contact them and ask the two of them if they have any interest in keeping that in there or if that was just a one-off. And and I think the, the, the thing about the fire and safety, those licenses, if we put in this general one, then we don't need that one because that one was so specific to, mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so do you want to quickly review the elections provisions at the beginning of this draft or do you want to save that for when the elections division is here? I think we'll save that because they're coming over tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. Except you can check I'm out what I've done so far. I actually did try to incorporate that um, or draft it so it would be codified statutory laws. So if you did want to review it in advance of tomorrow, um, I, I tried to incorporate your comments to date about when the um, elections authority applies and what types of states of emergency. So, Is that at the beginning of this? Yes. Um, oh. Yeah, if yeah. you want to just keep moving along, we can we can save that oh, yeah. for tomorrow if you'd like, and then um, we can move over to Tucker's draft if you'd like. Whatever works. And did you did you happen to? Um, I didn't look at this whole thing yet, but did you happen to get the municipal elections part? I did not hear back from. All right, we didn't hear from okay. the LCT that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, still, that Australian ballot language would be in there on page mm -hmm. four. Mm -hmm. um, as I recall from your conversation, to allow a municipality to move to Australian ballot, you you talked about having it being during a state of emergency within that municipality specifically. Um, and then I just have some uh, comments in there for you to consider about the timing, you know, of when a municipal a legislative body would be able to. Um, how far in advance could they use this authority to apply Australian ballots to future elections? But I don't think it's going to capture everything that VLCT, it sounded like VLCT wanted to do for town meeting. Yeah, so let's, let's, um, we'll, I'll try and, we'll try and get them um, tomorrow also. Sounds good. So we can, I'm sure I had a question since we're, before we go too far on um, beyond yes. licenses, and that was, 
for extension, um, you know, granting this power to extend, do you want to put an outside limit on that? You know, I'm just thinking if emergency rules are good for 180 days, at which point you we either the session, we should be back in session again, or you can reapply to extend an emergency rule or start all over, I think. Um, I'm just wondering if we want to put a limit on how that would be offered. I think in the when they did it before, when they extended the deadlines, they did it. It the extension ended 90 days after the end of the declared emergency. So it gave them time to catch up, but okay. at the end of that 90 days. Am I right about that? I see Tucker nodding his head. Yes, that's correct. And that time frame was chosen specifically for the municipalities. It lined up with how much time they would need to put out notices and warnings for the meetings that they would have to hold to start moving forward with those programs. Some of those programs, specifically their zoning meetings and planning meetings. But wasn't the same 90 days um, true for like DMV? Um, for those, uh, for getting your registrations and your licenses and stuff? I'm not sure about that. The section that the committee worked on and that I helped you with dealt with, again, just the licenses and permits going to municipalities or being issued from municipalities to uh, individuals. So uh, in large part, the concern was around the uh, planning commissions and planning boards and um, some of the deadlines that they were running up against during COVID where they had to supply plans to the state for approval. And then at the local level, they were dealing with a kind of backlog of zoning permits that were coming up. Right, okay, I do remember that. And, and I was talking more, I was thinking more about back to OPR extensions. I mean, I suppose there'd be some, it'd be helpful to have everyone sort of operating on the same schedule if it made oh, sense. Wouldn't that be great? Sort of like school, school calendar. Wouldn't it be great if everybody was on the same schedule? Not necessarily. Mm. People in different parts of the state have different um, uh, festivals and uh, different things to celebrate, like our, oh. school, our school vacation coincides with with um, our winter carnival. And if we'd have to change winter carnival, if we changed the... God forbid. No. We, well, they have too many fine. vacations anyway. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> So I will check with um, Suzanne Young then about the, the general to um, follow up on Chris's comment about <coughs> in, in general, if we should have some kind of a deadline. And I, I, I for some reason, thought that um, they all extended for 30 days, I mean, for 90 days after, but I may be completely wrong. But so. We'll check with that and see, so we can get I, that. I thought it was too, the, yeah. But I think it would be great to include this if we can figure it out. 90 days, it strikes me as is a good number after a declared emergency and each department could set their own. I mean, maybe some could do it faster. Yeah, but that would be an outside. Yeah. All right, are we ready to move on to to Tucker. Thank you, Betsy Ann. All right. Okay. Okay. So we have your, um, uh, oh, look at, isn't this nice? Okay. Would you like to start? Sure. So uh, as a brief in introduction here, I put together a few sections um, that combine the issues discussed yesterday that you had uh, 
agreed should be made somewhat permanent or at least permanently available in the case of a future emergency. Most of the language is taken directly from the bills that you had already passed, put here with some of the COVID specific provisions taken out. Um, there is some new language here that I'm going to highlight and take some time with so that you all can make some important policy decisions about how broad this should be. So the first section that we're gonna deal with is a uh, potential section that could be added to the open meeting law. This is a new section 312A that would be added to Title I, and it would deal with meetings of public bodies during a state of emergency. Uh, to start, one of the things that the committee discussed yesterday and agreed on is that there should be a term that encompasses both municipal and statewide public bodies that are affected by a state of emergency. So we started by defining an affected public body and the definition here is fairly broad. The definition is a public body whose regular meeting location is within an area affected by a hazard. So two things to note here. First, the public bodies that qualify under this, their qualification is tied to where they meet. So if you are a municipal public body, if your municipality is affected by the state of emergency, then uh, you would qualify as an affected public body. There may be some weaknesses there that you might want to explore. Um, so, you know, for example, we talked yesterday about the section that dealt with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and their deer herd management meetings. They have five regions where they hold those meetings. So you could potentially have uh, an emergency where they have physical meeting locations in one region, but electronic in others. Mm -hmm. um, this term, hazard, is the next definition. Um, this is tied to the definitions in the uh, emergency powers section, and I'll see did that just switch over to my browser for you guys? You can see the definition or did it not? Uh, I don't think so. All right. I can't see it, it's too tiny. It I says- will. I'm gonna stop and restart the share to see if I can pull you to that page. We've got your draft language up on the website too, which is easier to see. So uh, here is the definition of all hazards that's being borrowed. It's um, any natural disaster, health or disease related emergency, accident, civil insurrection, use of weapons of mass destruction, terrorist or criminal incident. I would recommend that you review this list and you discussed earlier that there may not be um, quite this long of a list of emergencies that would qualify for the temporary authority that you're providing. Um, this is the definition I used because it already exists in statute. This is a policy choice that you'll have to make. Um, whether these meetings should um, only be allowed to be held electronically with these special powers, when there's a public health emergency, or when there's a natural disaster, but not in the case of a significant event or radiological incident. So, Tucker, it, um, in this case, the event and the de declaration is determined by the commissioner as opposed to the governor. I think that we might want to make sure that this is a governor um, declared emergency. Where do you where do you see? Oh, in the definitions of hazard. Yeah. No. Oh yes. As is declared by the or is um, something by the commissioner. Okay. You know, uh, when we were in, when we're envisioning disaster, you know, declared emergencies, a radiological one is a good one, and Jeanette is most familiar with it because of Yankee. But wow, you know, if if for some sad, heartbreaking reason there, there was a, a radiological disaster, I mean, all the things we talked about with OPR and medical needs and stuff, man, we'd need those, you know. Tenfold. Although it would affect everybody. Stop here. Yeah. Because they'd all get contaminated. 
Ah, well, we we want to leave. So uh, before moving on just from this first subsection with the definitions, again, to highlight the choices that you may have to make um, mm -hmm. as I'm preparing this for next Tuesday or Friday or whenever this is coming up. Uh, first is uh, how you want to test whether a public body is affected by this. So right now the definition again ties it to a location that's affected by a hazard. Um, I don't know whether there should be a provision in there for the public bodies, you know, regular meeting being interrupted by the hazard or dislocated from their physical meeting space or whatever the case may be. And then the second is um, what should qualify as a hazard or emergency here. So it, it seems to me that your definition of affected public body is fine because whose regular meeting is located. If their regular meeting is has to be relocated, their regular meeting still was there. I, 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 that sounds fine to me. I think the hazard we need to look at. Uh. Okay. Subsection B contains the uh, temporary powers that I walked you through yesterday. I organized all of the open meeting authority that you granted in the previous COVID bills into one subsection here. Um, it notwithstands the uh, regular open meeting requirements and provides uh, the following temporary authorities. First, that uh, the quorum of the public body can attend any of those meetings by electronic means without designating a physical meeting location. That was one of the first things that you put together. Second, that uh, the members of the public body and their staff will not be required to attend that physical meeting location. Next, and this was in a separate bill from the preceding two provisions, um, the an affected public body of a municipality, so we're dealing specifically with municipalities here, can post uh, agendas and notices of special meetings in two electronic locations instead of physical locations. And finally, that in the event of a staffing shortage, an affected public body may extend the deadline for the posting of minutes. Can you just go back to the definition of affected body one second? As I was thinking about that, it, I, I'm not sure that I would use hazard, it, it, an area affected by the emergency or the declared emergency, because then I don't think we need to, if it's a declared, it has to be a declared emergency. It isn't just a hazard that, I mean, it has to be a declared emergency, I think. What do you, committee, what do you think? I like that. Because that way we don't have to define which hazards we're talking about. We don't have to define hazard at all. Right. right. Because it's the, whose regular meeting location is within an area affected by the declared emergency. If the declared emergency is just in the Northeast Kingdom, then that's where it is. If it's statewide, every town is affected. Right? Yeah. Okay. So the, um, the state of emergency does still have to be declared for all of these powers to come in. Mm -hmm. And when the governor declares a state of emergency, it is in response to a hazard under this section. And that's where the, um, the term hazard came in. I can uh, maybe work with Betsy to try to figure out what the best term would be to make sure that this is whatever comes out of a declaration will apply to um, okay. an affected public body. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is more of the OML language that you all passed during COVID. So when the affected public body meets electronically, they shall use technology that it permits attendance of the public. 
whenever feasible, allow access to the meeting by telephone. And finally, uh, post information on how the public may access meetings electronically and include it in their agenda. Again, this is all language that was in the previous OML COVID bills. Um, the legislative bodies of municipalities and school boards shall record their meetings that are held electronically unless there's some unusual circumstance that makes it impossible for them to do so. Um, and finally, within this section, uh, an affected public body shall continue to post notices and agendas in or near the municipal clerk's office and shall provide a copy of each notice or agenda to the newspapers of general circulation. That was language that was in the posting of notices work that you did in your temporary COVID authority bills. Tucker, can you go back to the end of page one, just very quickly? About the, yeah, number four. Was that in the other bill? It was. Okay. Then I don't need to go any further. Thank you. Okay. Section Y and Z we can uh, cover together. They were part of the same bill. We went over it uh, yesterday. It dealt with the quasi-judicial proceedings and specifically appeals uh, to grand list determinations. As you may recall, there were two levels of it. There's the BCA level where the BCA is holding the hearing and inspecting the property. And then there's the Department of Taxes hearing officer level. You pass the bill that contained both of them. They affect different sections of statute. So I took the authority that you gave them in those two bills and tucked them into their specific areas. So right. first section Y deals with uh, the section on appeals from listers as to the grand list. And after a lot of unamended text, we get the sections that you passed earlier. Highlighted hazard again, because I was not sure whether it's a term that is going to come up or um, what is going to trigger this authority. Um, but it is the same language where the board can either move forward without conducting the physical inspection, or if the property owner wants an inspection to take place and requests it, they can do so electronically. And the same language is applied to the hearing officers inspections in that section. So the end here, um, first the repeal in section XY, this is the uh, statute that required the segregation of town highway funds from general funds and prevented any co-mingling. So that uh, statute would just be repealed. That prohibition on co-mingling would go away. And uh, there's different effective dates that will go into this if and when you move forward with a bill like this. Um, and I just put in random dates, but it was to highlight that that section on town highway funds would likely have to be delayed until uh, the start of the next fiscal year for most municipalities. And that would prevent a village from collecting and enforcing for the following fiscal year, town or village road taxes that could then be commingled by the superior municipality surrounding them. And it would alleviate any of those um, concerns that were brought up during the and session. Is it, and is it clear that it's, <clears throat> this is, the, the state highway funds that come to the town are still kept separate. Because that was a concern by transportation. Uh, when those concerns were discussed uh, and Anthea and I worked on it, it was not, um, it wasn't entirely clear that this specific section 19 VSA 312 dealt at all with the funds that are part of highway grants from the state. Okay. Uh, what we found is that this section was dealing very specifically with 
funds that are raised through a local tax. Okay. Um, I can work with Anthea and see if there's a way to repeal and maybe amend those other sections to make sure that they can't be commingled with the general funds of the town. Um, if that's helpful. Well, just so that we know, because that is a question that's going to come from transportation. Uh, the remaining sections that we went through yesterday didn't end up here for one of two reasons. Either they were cured by um, a change in the ability of a town to vote by Australian ballot for certain issues or could be cured by a change to town meeting uh, requirements. Um, or in the case of the deadlines on licenses, renewals, municipal plans, uh, that there could be more specific fixes than the kind of general language that you passed earlier in the session. I didn't get that. The, I thought that there were two sections in there. One was about the um, municipal, mm -hmm. uh, the um, uh, permits, that were issued from the town, I mean, from the state to the town and then from the town to the people. Right. And I thought that, um, but those aren't in here. They are not in here yet. I can take those two general sections if that's how the committee wants to move forward. Uh, my notes from yesterday, I had written down that you wanted to hear from someone, maybe from either the agencies or from VLCT about, uh, what should and should not be included in those in extensions because this could arise at a different time of year than it did last oh. time and there might be more specific parts of statute that need to be addressed okay thank you okay questions anybody no no well well done tucker What's yeah. Good? Thank you. I think we're going to have a, a decent bill. I do too. And it will be the first bill that is in response to what we, as far as I know, that, that is incorporating the lessons we've learned. So to, um, tomorrow I'll uh, we're going to do elections, and then I'll see if we can get VLCT to talk about the, muni the municipal elections, and then these two questions about the, the permits and the licensing. And also, uh, Suzanne Young asked her if she has any um, from the governor's office about the permits and stuff that are extended to municipalities from the state. And, and, and Jeanette, you might also ask her, uh, as we were talking about the license extensions, that all the, you said all the administ that we would want to have general enough language so that all the licenses that fell under the governor and administration would have some general provision of being extended through. Yep. yep. Okay. Anything else <clears throat> that we need tomorrow? Another nice so, day. We should think about that, the um, emergency thing. I'll also ask her about that. Yeah. <clears throat> about, um, because something has to trigger it as a um, declared emergency. And how do we need to define that further or do we just need to, um, I mean, uh, when the governor uh, declares, for example, um, the damage that was done in Chittenden County by the, the free, the lake. By the storm, by the rain and the right. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about the ice, but um, yeah. by the rain, that's a declare it's they're declared a a, a state of emergency, right? So they yep. can get federal FEMA funds. But right. that it may not be the kind of declared emergency that we're 
I mean, it may or it may not, but I don't know that we would want to extend all of these things in a case like that where it, it didn't necessarily impede their ability to do, to do business. Right. There's just a lot of damage and we want federal FEMA funds. Maybe if I could just to ask either Betsy Ann or Tucker, I'm trying to recall, it seems as though there's always reasons listed in the declaration as to why this is being declared. And I don't know whether we could work off of those. In other words, to your point, Madam Chair, when the declaration was made about the ice storm, it specifically mentioned why the governor was declaring it and where it was in effect and all that sort of stuff. I think you can't just say we're under a state of emergency. There has to be a reason for it. And I don't know whether that might intersect with what we need in terms of allowing specific authority to do X, Y, and Z. But would we want, if so, they declared that state of emergency in, I don't know if it was all of Chittenden County or along the lake, wherever it was, would we, would that say, would this say then that those towns now didn't have to have physical meetings because they are in the affected area. Um, I think that we wanna make sure that it's an emergency that somehow impacts yeah. the ability to do a business. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what I'm saying here. But I know what you mean. <laughs> well, good, well, you write it down then. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be a lawyer if I could. Betsy, what do you think? Is this, this is in regard to when the governor declares a state of emergency? Yeah, we don't want to we don't want to let town X pretty much do whatever they want just because there's an ice storm which could go away in 24 hours. So we have to be careful to make sure that it, it's a real one that's going to be around for a while and would interrupt normal governmental activity. And, and wasn't declared a state of emergency in order to qualify for FEMA funds. Yeah. So that's, that's what the governor has in the emergency management chapter, 20 VSA chapter one, um, the governor has the authority to proclaim a state of emergency within the entire state or any portion of it in the event of an all hazards event. Um, that causes or may cause substantial damage or injury to persons or property. An all hazards event is defined yeah. as could be multiple things. Um, it's a natural disaster, health or disease related emergency, accident, I, civil insurrection, et cetera. It's what, it's what Tucker just showed us, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I wasn't, sorry, I wasn't, uh, I was doing and, something else. So maybe Tucker, that is appropriate <clears throat> to leave that. Tucker, on, on that, is it possible for you to make it a hyperlink? I know this is lazy of me, but I have no idea how to. <laughs> Can you make that 20 VSA piece in, in your draft a hyperlink so we can click on it and actually review that all hazards definition? Or is I, it easy to find? I, I just don't find via the, the statutes easy to search. I know you guys do. I apologize. I need to learn how to search them more easily. Allison just learned hyperlink yesterday, and now she wants to use it as much as possible. <laughs> I don't I even know how to never ever betray my dear sweet drafting manual by embedding a hyperlink <laughs> in a draft, but I'll do you one better. I'll send you all directly a <laughs> link. Send us the, the, the <laughs> Thanks. OK, so that, it, that might be. That might be because I suppose if the if the governor did declare it under one of those circumstances, the governor has to declare it. But I I was confused there because I thought it said that it was declared by the commissioner of public safety, and I <clears throat> no maybe the commissioner of public safety determines whether and then advises the governor. Or something, but the governor has to declare it. Okay. All right, so that might, it might be okay the way you did it. 
Yeah, the, the question that I did a bad job of highlighting is whether that list in that all hazards definition is too general for some of the things you're looking at. Yeah. So some of the open meeting provisions that you brought forward, you were bringing forward because you couldn't meet in that physical space, right? Right. And I don't know if that entire list, you know, one of the items in the list is just a significant event. And I didn't know whether, or an accident, for example. So if a state of emergency is declared because of some significant accident, but the public body can still meet, is that a reason to give them the authority to not meet in that space? Yeah. So you may want to review that definition and determine whether there are things that you want to pull out, um, you know, for the- Or perhaps, regulations. perhaps in, in the, not in the definition, but in the um, in in the different sections, it would be and oh, if you're talking about open meetings, it would be a hazard or a declared emergency that prohibits that <clears throat> because in a in a health emergency we might you know if there's a some kind of a, a leak or something like that we might want to have those health provisions here so the 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 provisions would be uh, tailored to the how their how the response is impacted by the emergency. Does that make sense? That it absolutely makes sense. And again, my apologies. I'm coming off the bench from a few weeks of uh, you know rest here. But um, what what I mentioned was a test. What is the test that you should use to determine whether this kicks in? Yeah. And for the meetings, it may just be that you're dislocated from your regular physical meeting location or that you're somehow prohibited from meeting there. Right. I think it would be just prohibited from meeting in person because you could be dislocated because the town hall burned down, but you could still meet at the fire station. Or in our case, our fire station caught. Right. But don't forget that with all these things, you're still going to need the governor to declare that state of emergency. So if the town hall yeah. burns down and Good there's problem. no declared state of emergency, then these powers are not available. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But but just to clarify, they 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 could decide to meet elsewhere, right? Yeah. I mean, that's within their power to do that, right? Unless it's the, a public health emergency like this so that they're prohibited from meeting in person. So <clears throat> the provisions would be impacted by I, how the emergency affects the, the activity, whether it's um, if there's a, <clears throat> some kind of a, a, an emergency that knocks out that DMV can't issue and they declare some kind of emergency and the state can't issue permits, but people are can still meet, then that's a different, we need to be able to tie, <clears throat> tie the activity to the um, impact of the emergency on the activity. Right. Good. <clears throat> Good work. All right. <clears throat> well, so, and Betsy Ann, um, I think Senator Lyons was going to see if you, if there were, it was anything that Jen, that you needed to talk to Jen about. And I don't know if that would be you or Tucker. Is it, would it be you, Betsy Ann? Okay. Yeah, thanks. I will, I'll loop Jen in definitely about um, <clears throat> borrowing from the provisions that she drafted for Act 91 for right. OPR and Board of Medical Practice. I'll give her a heads up and um, that Seneca Vops is pursuing these as statutory provisions. Um, and then I can also just check in with her also if there's other things that we're overlooking. Okay. <clears throat> Do any of the other committees have things that need to, that we should be incorporating in here? Ag or natural resources or? Economic development? No, I, I, I don't think so. Tucker? One thing that I'll note is that yesterday you put a bookmark in the moratoria on universal water disconnects. 
Oh yeah. Wastewater disconnects. You wanted the chair of natural resources to be able to weigh in on that issue. Does anybody know the chair of natural resources or where we could contact him or her? He, he was so in the room isolated. at the time, but I, we couldn't see him or hear him. I know he fro he completely just froze and disappeared. He's quiet. I think, he, I think he's, he went to the Senate. He didn't know we were on Zoom and he went to the Senate instead. Exactly. He's, oh. he's actually quarantined in the Senate. Oh, it that's has been for four months, five months. Because no one else is there, so he can do that. Okay. Well, Chair of Natural Resources, you are muted. <laughs> <coughs> Would you like to speak to us, Chair of Natural Resources? <coughs> Actually, I think I can unmute him. Hang on. Mike, can you unmute him? Maybe he doesn't want to be. Um, no, Madam Chair, we only have the power to ask him to unmute himself. He retains the ultimate power of his voice being heard. <clears throat> do, do you have something to say, Chris? There. Yeah. I, I was clicking with my mouse. It was not, it was like, I, it wasn't doing anything. It was just leaving me clicking for nothing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to sort of locked out. Uh, at any rate, the, so I was going to say when you said other areas, most of what we did this spring at first, when all this stuff got going, was check into the basic things like wastewater, potable, uh, you know, town water, connections, disconnections, um, electric bills, gas bills, all that kind of stuff. And some of the provisions we ended up moving forward were things like we, some of this related to licensing because wastewater treatment facility operators, it turns out were, um, I don't know if all or some were on a spring renewal all of a sudden no one could go do their uh, four hours of continuing ed to finish the training to get the renewal or something like that. So that's the kind of thing we did for the most part was allow people and then we had to change some, we did a little work to make sure that operators who were licensed in one place could without liability pitch in at a neighboring town's facility if people were all out sick at facility one uh, they could come in and help facility too. So uh, I, I'd say the thing that most reminds me of what we've been doing in here was the um, flexibility around relicensing. Um, and that would be covered with your discussion, I think, Jeanette, with the administration of the extension of licenses. Um, there's also, you know, in terms of laws, like in, there is, it's a, there's a constitutional right to enforcement discretion. Uh, you can't do it for a whole class of individuals. It needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. So there is some flexibility when someone for good reason, um, maybe an emergency, is not gonna be able to meet a regulation um, that the uh, a, the government can choose not to enforce a law. This was part, in a way, this is how they said um, that bottle redemption centers, although the law says if you sell, you got to redeem for the most part. Um, they said, well, guess what? We're, we're not going to enforce that law for a little while if you don't want to accept bottles back. Then it turned out that was all safe and sanitary to do, and they resumed. So some of these things are inherent, there's inherent flexibility. So do you think we need to do anything here or it's going to be taken care of in a general? <clears throat> um, well, we should probably uh, just double check. <clears throat> it was one, there is a little awkwardness. Some stuff happens through OPR and some stuff happens through uh, ANR. I, like I think it was ANR that did the wastewater treatment facility regulate uh, licensing, so. Just wouldn't want to leave somebody out inadvertently just because we have a, a sort of split system for regulation. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So we'll, I'll try and get all these people for some tomorrow and some on Tuesday. Tucker, Tucker. I wanted to 
to make sure that we touched on the issue that you all had reviewed yesterday, which was disconnections from water services. Uh, currently, there's a moratorium on disconnections from water and wastewater services. And the questions that you all had were around whether that's something that should be automatically triggered in the future yeah. under declared state of emergency, maybe some particular declared state of emergency um, where your water and sewer cannot be shut off if you are incapable of paying your bill during the state of emergency. And yeah, that, Chris, that was, <clears throat> do we want to put that in here or not? Sure. And we covered, so we also, we covered this and, and finance was involved as well because they regulate. We have this strange split system in the Senate with, uh, but I would just say, yes. So we looked at all the basic services. So, uh, town, you know, drinking water, waste, um, wastewater, electrical, um, uh, regulated utilities like natural gas, uh, <laughs> these people, the people count on, they, they all were given a, a moratorium on disconnects. And then subsequently, you know, money has been distributed to the utilities so that those who did not pay, um, bills can be waived. I don't know the exact process they're using to waive um, bills, but part of it is as Commissioner Tierney said, for someone who's uh, financially challenged, the last thing you want to do is then start to rack up a bunch of, uh, oh, you know, behind on um, payment and start ruining someone's credit history. So they're trying to make sure that those who are economically disadvantaged don't become even more disadvantaged by an inability to make timely payments. I hate to say it now, you're muted. Right, okay. Do we need to put in here that provision that we put in about disconnect from water and sewer? Or is that gonna be assumed? Or is it something, because it is a, do we need to put that in here? Like we did in the bill originally. So um, you we're talking about inserting this into municipal water and no, sewer? No, we're, we're not doing a municipal bill here. We're doing a <clears throat> comprehensive lessons we learned. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're doing OPR and board of medical practice. And so this isn't a municipal bill. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because we end up with more than one system delivering these services. Um, yes, I would say this, this was a fun, to, to us, it was a fundamental thing. Make sure everyone can keep on having all these basic services. Okay. <clears throat> so this would be the con uh, the nexus here would be a disaster that um, <clears throat> impacts people's ability to pay their um, their their bills. Their it wouldn't be any kind of a disaster. It would be a disaster that had that impact. Right. So it's really like a, an economic disaster. On right. For okay. Got that, Tucker? Okay. <clears throat> so I'm gonna switch a little bit here and then I'm gonna get off and let you guys get off and um, uh, contact all these people. But, and, and if anybody else has anything to add, but we talked about the VSEA thing and I said that I would tell you what. <clears throat> um, the, I had a conversation today with uh, Beth Fastigi. And I don't think the, um, I don't think that they, the administration is opposed to putting off reopening the negotiations for the contract <clears throat> until um, there's some need to. Like um, we, we don't know now if we should reopen them or not because <clears throat> next year when we do the budget, we may fully fund the pay act and then there is no need to. Their, their concern was around the language, the specifics of the language. So I think that um, 
we we can work that out and they're working with the house um, appropriations committee to try and get the language right um, the language that bsea gave us said that <clears throat> it, they couldn't reopen until the legislature adjourned well it's really until the bill the budget is passed and which they they do coincide but it assuming that we could pass a budget and then not adjourn for a while if we don't fully fund the pay act they want to be able to <clears throat> reopen the negotiations right away when they know that it, there isn't sufficient funding in there so that was <clears throat> i just got that so i don't know that there's um we we can have the discussion but about whether we want to just tell the appropriations committee that um we we agree with the concept the wording should be really worked out by appropriations i think <clears throat> betsy ann hey just to give you an update yeah house appropes voted on approving language that just confirmed what the legislative intent was um, from their perspective for inclusion in the budget. Um, so you should okay. be seeing that, assuming it stays in the bill as currently presented. And I think that that's what <clears throat> Beth said is that she was she'd offered to come in and talk to us, but she felt that it would be premature until the House actually had some language. And it might be language that the administration actually supports. So. Good. So we can take a deep breath on this. <clears throat> yeah, I think that there's, <clears throat> I understood that the controversy was around whether or not to reopen right now, but that I had totally misunderstood that or it had been misrepresented to me anyway. So the controversy was about the, not the intent, but the specific language. So I just, I just wanted to pass that on to you so that <clears throat> you knew why we weren't necessarily pursuing that. And I did send the rest of the budget stuff to, to the Appropriations Committee. Anything else? No, no. 